I think one thing I can say is at the beginning, at least this, this gentleman did not want to quit using marijuana. And now it sounds like, at least, well, he was lying about his views, but you know, maybe he's thinking about suboxone is more important. At, so, at a certain point, he has to make a decision to choose one of them, right? Because <laughs> if, yeah, if we emphasize our, our rule and uh, you know, clinic policy. Thank you. What if he wasn't willing to make up the meetings? How would you handle it then? So in, in our program, typically that's also um, a reason for kind of intensification or a higher level of care. So when we move people to the higher level of care, it wipes out all the outstanding meetings that they have. Because sometimes when people get up to like owing us, I mean, we use that language owing us or they they need to make up um, you know 15 meetings that just seems completely overwhelming and undoable and so when people get to that point if they're not making progress towards getting to more than four a week which is the only way you begin to make them up um, and still tr struggling to get to the minimum we will move them to a higher level of care and then they can really focus on problem solving what are the barriers to getting to treatment how do I overcome those barriers talking with other group members about how they overcome those barriers themselves. And then it wipes up that, wakes out that backlog for them that's hanging over their heads. But it's typically a higher level of care. And a lot of patients would choose to do that. Yeah. How often do you all move them to APMAT for less than 28 days? I've been doing that a lot and I'm thinking maybe too much. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, it feels like too long for like a minor issue to escalate the care. And then it is, the original plan was a 28-day sort of guidepost of the goal of duration of therapy, but it obviously varies by person, right? Yeah, I think you can make that on a case, make that determination on a case-by-case -case basis. It's generally good to have a, a minimum um, because you're going to need to have at least enough time to see some progress in the direction that that you're trying to encourage people to go, whatever that you know, whatever the particular infraction was or struggle is uh so it would have to be at least two weeks i would think but yeah i mean you could make it less if they're making clear progress in the direction that we want to reinforce are there any other questions or comments in the uh, group everyone out there before we move on to the next case All right, um, I'll pull up your other case now. Um, let's see. Can you see that all right? All right, so this is, it's my pattern of presenting every pregnant patient that comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> Even if there's not a really good reason to present them, but I did come up, I, I, did, I had worked hard to come up with a question to, to make the case have a theme, but more, more, mostly it's just so that I can say that I bounced this off echo. And this one does, is a little higher risk than my average one because the OB doctors in me, well, we never managed to coordinate, but we're in this situation is we're not agreeing on therapy and not coordinating. So, uh, so that's why I definitely want to coordinate at least with WVU team. I'd like to coordinate with the OB doctors um, more directly, but uh, um, this particular privacy law just really makes me anxious to, to call them. Even if I have like a patient release to discuss their care, um, I feel like maybe like I'll, I'll say something that will make the patient mad and, uh, and, that was, and they'll say that was beyond what the release was meant for. Uh, when it comes to just like, you know, once you start getting into a discussion, things start getting just very open-ended very quickly. And it's very hard to not accidentally uh, reveal information that you'd rather or not about the patient to the OB doctor. So, uh, so what I've recently had come to my clinic is a 29-year-old female uh, white patient on Medicaid that um, uh, was already on Suboxone through another clinic. The other clinic physician uh, preferred that not to manage pregnant patients at all. And so, um, 
and the patient had heard good things about me wonderfully and so they came to me and I said, um, yeah, uh, well, this will be fine. It will be fine for you just to stay on Suboxone on the dose you're on. Um, and we can, and she seemed stable at the time. She, as soon as she found out she was pregnant, she discontinued all of her uh, stimulant usage and other drug usage. And so she was, I think, just seven days sober when I met her. But she, um, she was very motivated to, to be uh, uh, sober throughout the remainder of her pregnancy and just stay on just what I recommended, which was Suboxone, um, until she went to go see her OBGYN about a week later at five weeks pregnant, um, who advised her that she should not be on Suboxone anymore uh, and that I should shift her to Subutex. And, um, and so she and gave her lots of warnings about how dangerous Suboxone is. And so she, she came back to me very, very worried that I had given her poor information and she, she would prefer to switch to Subutex. So um, on the day this happened, I texted Dr. Barry and I, I said, does, does WVU switch to Subutex in this situation? Dr. Barry um, advised me that um, he's had too many bad experiences and that WVU is moving towards or already has a policy to, to avoid subutex, um, uh, or at least switching suboxone to subutex in pregnant patients. Um, so so I, gu I guess one of the main purposes, the real question for this is, um, if that policy exists um, um, on paper or not, and, uh, and is it 100% practiced? And, um, but for me, as long as I have, um, support from WVU from this conference call uh, I'll, uh, for whatever uh, approach I take. I think that will be helpful when I see the patient again next week and say, I can talk to your bunch of addiction experts about your case and this is what they say. And, and we'll try to see stuff again. But um, uh, this one, I'd, I don't really have a dog in the fight that I can't, it's not that I, I, I don't have super strong personal opinion on Subutex versus Suboxone because I have never ever used Subutex um, previously. So, um, so I have bad experiences in the past to be afraid of yet, but um, if the more experienced physicians that have been there, done that, um, are strongly against it, um, even though, you know, the OB field obviously is still pushing Subutex over Suboxone, I'll, I will come down on the side of WVU addiction psychiatry and, and, uh, <laughs> And, and, and support you all over their OB recommendations. And I think, I think she would accept that, those recommendations and, and do what's, what was advised. But I think there's a chance that she'll go elsewhere where, and there will be plenty of other people willing to just give her subutex. Um, and unfortunately, one of, the, one of those physicians who is willing to give subutex, who is the most likely for her to be um, sent to, who's a high-risk pregnancy doctor, is in tapering off Subutex at the last month of pregnancy. And we've presented cases with that physician before. We've got several patients who have lost their children because of relapses um, at the end of pregnancy associated with that late pregnancy taper. And so I have, I guess maybe I do have a little bit of a dog in the fight because I, I really wouldn't, don't want to see bad outcome for her. You know, I, I want to do what's best for her. So I, uh, I, I worry that um, that the current practices that are occurring here are not consistent with ASAM recommendations for management of pregnant women, but that's where she'll go if we don't have um, agreement on best practice treatment for this patient. And um, so, so uh, Dr. Baltier, I don't know if you wait, want to weigh in on ACOG recommendations because tapering women off um, of buprenorphine. Uh, is definitely against ACOG, so. Yeah, so I actually, um, or I haven't looked at those lately, but everybody that I, I'm part of a big list serve on all this, and nobody really advocates tapering women. There are some people doing that and, you know, trying some other things, but what you see, what you saw there in terms of somebody coming off and relapse, and that's what we see. It just makes no sense, and so you're putting them more at risk of that, um, and so, 
Um, I'm not against if the patient's really motivated, but I haven't had anybody in the last three years that we've been able to do that with. It's just, I mean, and Laura, I think you, you guys probably the same thing. It's, it's really hard. This is the most stressful part of their life, you know, the whole bit. Um, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense to put them at risk for, for relapse. In terms of your question about um, Sebutex, I'm following what WV has been doing. I've been doing it from day one with the pregnant women. And Laura's got a whole stack of articles that she sent us to support that. Um, and so there's really no reason to not do the, the Suboxone. We had a little bit of a barrier with some of our pharmacies at first, but now it's not an issue. That said, there are a couple of patients that I've either put on Subutex, have already come to me, they're, out, they're within a few weeks of delivery, and I've continued them, which I know Morgantown doesn't always do. Um, and then I've had a few people that just have had horrible nausea and just, I, you know, they could be lying, but it's, you know, they're, they're losing weight, you know, they're having other OB issues. The advantage I have is I do both. Um, and so, you know, I have to talk to myself mostly, um, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, but that's how we've done it. And so I think you've got pretty good evidence from Morgantown, you know, it's kind of your big backup that this, there's, you know, this isn't more harmful um, than, it, you know, and actually I think there's less diversion, there's less risk. And my patients have finally, you know, after a couple of years of the same story, they believe it, and so they're they're okay with it. It also protects them from people stealing it from them. You know, there's more street value. So I try to sell them on that. You know, we do the urine test to protect you from, you know, to show that you're clean. That kind of positive spin on it. Um, in terms of communicating with the OBs, um, because we do all our suboxone treatment under um, a kind of um, primary care model, so. Um, we don't worry as much about the, um, you know, they sign a broader confidentiality agreement. You know, it's the same HIPAA, so it's not, um, so that makes it a little bit easier, and all our patients kind of understand that. So I don't really have, you know, all my residents know what's in the chart. It's part of their chart. It's part of their problem list, et cetera. Um, you may or may not be comfortable with that. Um, it sounds like, you know, definitely your OBs have a different style of practice there. Um, uh, but I think I wouldn't say that they're in the mainstream of people doing this treatment. Now they may be in the mainstream of OBs cause they don't do a lot of it. And actually there's just a study out recently about who's providing buprenorphine treatment for pregnant women. And it's mostly not OBs. It's primary care docs um, because you know, it's just the way it is. And so, um, cause this is happening in smaller areas and there aren't a lot of OBs doing it. Um, and so the ACOG was saying OBs need to step up. <laughs> and and kind of do more of this um so i think what you're doing is appropriate i would show her some of the articles that laura has um and then you know i mean you've got a long pregnancy to go if she's five weeks so, you know it's not like it's the last month or anything like that um, so yeah ryan so you can share with whomever whether it's the patient and or the ob we've we switched over in october of 2015 which is a while ago prescribing um, pretty much exclusively Suboxone or the, you know, the, the non-mono product uh, to pregnant women and have had no, you know, negative outcomes with regard to that change. And we actually did a study here, Dr. Marshall and I did a study here, um, comparing outcomes for women on Subutex versus Suboxone. And then there are at least four or five pretty strong studies that have been done um, nationally and even internationally, there's a good study that um, was done in Canada. I can send you those articles. Um, and I would encourage you to share them with the OB. We actually also have a letter that I can yep. send you a copy of um, that's signed by like Dr. Barry and Dr. Marshalik and me um, that explains kind of a letter to OBs that explains for the patient too, that explains why we've made the decision to use the, you know, the buprenorphine plus naloxone um, as opposed to the mono product. Um, and specifically for some of the things that Dr. Baltiera said, um, diversion, misuse, and um, people being a target for, for theft and, and stuff like that. Um, so if you want me to actually, I can send them to you and you can send them out to everybody. Absolutely, thank you. The, the barriers, uh, uh, the, back in the old days when we were still using um, 
uh, Subutex uh, buprenorphine monoproduct. Um, I was treating some patients in the uh, jail here in Martinsburg, and one woman was getting her Subutex and um, keeping it under her tongue long enough to take it out later and sell it to a fellow inmate. And, uh, you know, the, the diversion is very real with that stuff. And uh, the, the, I don't think she could have done that with the strip. With the, um, uh, the strip wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't work that way, I don't believe. Uh, so um, it was a good lesson. And definitely Subutex will be diverted when it can be. I'll be very excited to get those articles in that letter. I think that letter could be yeah, very powerful so, uh, yeah. for this patient to make a and for the and for the her OB. I'd like to forge better relationships with OB. So yes, uh, I think that's something I could do without worrying about confidentiality as well. So OB. Yeah, I mean, you could have a conversation with the OB. Um, obviously the OB knows she's on medicine, but without even talking about the patient specifically, just say, you know, my understanding is you may have or you may be referring patients to us or we may have a shared patient i just wanted to explain you know why we prescribe this medication versus another um, but we our our patients actually are pretty comfortable signing releases because they want us to like talk to their doctors and explain what treatment is and that we're not just you know handing out medication and collecting cash and, you know, that, that we're, we hold people accountable and we do regular urine drug screens um, and have group therapy and all of those things that are part of the program, uh, which is not always what people envision when they think about Suboxone. Yeah, and Ryan, that letter was really, really helpful um, when I started using it because, you know, you get this thing on letterhead, and, you know, it, it, it was very helpful for the pharmacist to, to use that in the patients too. Yes, I feel like the letter solves all my problems. So my cases are <laughs> oh, wow. didactic if there's time. So thank you so much for that second case, Ryan. Um, were there any other questions out there for the group or anyone in here have any other comments or questions? Um, can I make a comment, please? Sure, absolutely. Hi. So um, I would be interested in having any type of um, evidence-based research or information because up here in Pittsburgh uh -huh. at West Penn uh, Hospital and in our perinatal hope clinic, um, and I've done it personally with patients too, we are still switching all of our OB patients to Subutex. So um, anything uh, information wise and practice wise that uh, anyone would feel would be beneficial to me up here to start changing that practice I would be really interested in I thank you guys for that that's I'm almost like a little <laughs> I'm like oh my gosh we should have been doing this so um, I, I really appreciate this information I just wanted to thank you for that and then please send it to me yeah, and the, yeah. the reason that we switched when we did was we were seeing really an increase in IV use of Subutex that patients were both um, talking about or that we found evidence of in terms of people not looking better and then um, having evidence of, of injection uh, use. Um, and then it being corroborated by, by patient report. And, and oftentimes that may have been how they were using on the street before they came in um, illicit drugs or even you know, they were using Subutex off the street. And transitioning to the film can be really helpful with um, transitioning them off of in injection drug use and all of the associated kind of risks of, of being, being on that. Um, we also had found that it was really hard to transition people back onto uh, the Suboxone film, that they were, they just believed that the only thing that was going to work for them was the Subutex. Um, and we then, have we have had that up here too, where we're having a hard time transitioning people back. They're very resistant to it. Yeah, and the advantage here in West Virginia is that um, Medicaid will not, you know, it's pre-approved to get them Suboxone. So I tell them I can get your Suboxone today. Um, I okay. I have to get approval for Subutex. Um, 
And so it's much easier since they did that. So Subutex, I still have to get pre-approval, prove they're pregnant, et cetera. Okay. The Suboxone, it's been really nice when they just said, okay, that's all approved. You don't have to get approval for Suboxone right. too. And so that's kind of where we are. And so the patients are, oh, I need it today. Good. And then it, it's worked out. And then they're going to have to transition off of it as soon as they're not pregnant in West Virginia anyway for Medicaid. So. So I, I have had a couple that I've kept on because of severe nausea, but it, after, you know, losing weight and having to prove that. And so, again, okay. um, and probably be worth, and I'll see, I, I probably have a lit review. And if I can find it on the literature I found, I'll send it out to everybody in the group because it, it's a great question. It, it's a tough one to kind of, you know, convince people that don't see it. Um, although Laura, and I don't know, um, our psychiatrists there too. I used to tell patients that it doesn't really get absorbed into them, but WVU just changed to a new Suboxone testing. And actually I do see the naloxone in there. So, I mean, I can't say that totally anymore. The amounts aren't probably very large, but um, with the new testing, we are seeing the naloxone in moms. So you know, just another, you know, the sign, everything keeps developing and we keep learning more. It also, the, I, I remember when, when we, when we uh, started changing, actually, the, the, the original study supporting a subutex was not really very strong. Like, so the uh, original studies, I mean, the concern was we don't know what naloxone does to babies, right? And so the evidence that naloxone did anything bad was in um, animal studies where they gave enormous amounts of naloxone to rats. Um, so this is a relatively small amount of naloxone because the buprenorphine product is most, I mean, the suboxone is mostly um, buprenorphine, not, there's just a small amount of naloxone and, uh, you know, not in amounts that are as large as were in those studies and there were never any studies on humans, obviously. They're actually with the, with the support of Vivitrol, there will likely be some uh, studies uh, on pregnant women looking at uh, Vivitrol as an, an option. So um, those will come down the pike, but all of the studies that have been done to date that I'm aware of did not show any negative effects on the fetus, whether it's like birth weight or head circumference or, you know, all the markers were, were all the same. Uh, if they use it appropriately, sublingual actually, uh, naloxone is, is detectable, but it's not bioavailable. So the bioavailability is very minimal. So it's not really active at all, unless they shoot it. Right. <laughs> so. And that's why it'll show up in a urine drug screen, but uh, they Thank won't feel the effects of it. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. That's good. Yeah, because that, that, that explains it to me. I sometimes need to remind you. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, before we move on to the didactic, um, were there any other comments or questions about the case? Um, you can always email me afterwards if you think of more questions, and I'll make sure to have them addressed as well. All right. So we have about 10 more minutes left. Dr. Think, Shang, would you like to do? Just, uh, yeah, just, sure. Absolutely. I guess I would try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I don't know. It's easy it's or more difficult. I, I know. Try my we best. can we can always um you know continue it on on a later date as well. So. Well, see. I can try my best to just summarize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah. So I'll finish by five for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I um, think I'm gonna summarize. Yes. No, you're gonna. Can, can I can I just sure. uh, navigate? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is uh, actually. Part two of uh, my uh, two presentations. Basically, the first one we talked about um, um, the TeleMAT program. The second one we're going to talk about our a small study. This is a prospective prospective study. So basically, we follow up patients longitudinally for about 90 days. This is a weekly uh, population. So, and this is original. This is article. Uh, the name is self-reported sleep improvement in buprenorphine and MAT population. So basically it is self-reported. It's very important to say that because because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, studies on uh, sleep basically you have to do a sleep study. Uh, you have to um, you have to have 
objective objective measurements to to to, to tell you know people uh, how they you know how the sleep has improved the patient subject sleep has improved but in this uh, in this study we what we did was only uh, basically we only did a self report so the background is like uh, you know um opioid use disorder population uh, patients experience a lot of uh, experience a lot of sleep disturbance for sure I mean I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure everybody has this experience so when I talk to my DDE patients if you ask the group if you start a question regarding sleep everybody has a huge complaint then you're you know continue and continue and uh, basically it's endless so but the problem is the problem is studying sleep impairment in this population is very complicated the reason is which one a chicken and egg right which one causes which how can you say this population you know you use the box on in this population you follow up their sleep and how can you say well the sleep has improved is not because of something else because of the you know anything else so it's very hard to do that okay so what we're trying to do is trying to do two things we measure sleep and depression okay so i very briefly talk two minutes talk about the previous studies so generally speaking in substance use and disorder population. So the circadian rhythm can change because of uh, um, substance use. They, uh, they, they have frequent uh, wake up times. So basically they have fragmented sleep. They, they keep waking up all the time throughout the night. And that's, that's pretty, pretty normal uh, during active use and also withdrawal. And also, of course, the big problem is sleep disorder, the uh, breathing problem, which is basically sleep apnea, right? And uh, um, Studies have shown like a main, the main, we're talking about the, the main resting stage of our sleep is REM sleep and stage three, which is deep sleep, slow wave sleep. And you know, they're pretty much disrupted by, by, by substance use. So generally speaking, then in methadone uh, man, maintained patients, um, they did a lot of studies. They found like methadone basically can cause sleep apnea, can it's related to the dose. And they use the uh, Pittsburgh Sleep um, uh, Quality Index scores, which is a pretty common like a rating scale for sleep improvement. It's a 19 item uh, rating scale, and they found like basically people uh, on methadone they continue to use different kind of drugs. Then uh, of course the continued use of different uh, different drugs kind of really affect the score, and also the methadone dose is related. Then in buprenorphine um, uh, population is kind of very inconsistent. So it was very, you know, all the studies I, you know, I read basically it's not really uh, not conclusive first and also not consistent. There's some studies show like, a, you know, um, buprenorphine naloxone can induce significant sleep apnea and a hypoxemia. So basically it can make people worse. Uh, also some people, uh, some studies show like they can reverse the sleep apnea. Um, but overall, uh, the most important thing the sleep study uh, in this population shows that basically the tapering protocol, if you do slow tapering in this population, then patients' uh, sleep dis uh, disruption can be better, can be, can be minimal. So, um, so that means like basically how people, you know, if you take uh, uh, patients off Suboxone and you try to do it slow, slowly in this, uh, in, uh, you know, in this population, then that can help with a sleep problem. So, Again, in this study, we look at two things. One is primary outcome is basically we uh, we try to uh, we try to uh, to survey the patient, give them the, um, the questions, and try to uh, let them answer all those questions and uh, to uh, to investigate the sleep quality and uh, time and everything else. And then we the secondary outcome is the depression to see whether the you know the the depression depressive score has also can improve. Um, longitudinally with, um, you know, when into the recovery. So this way we will know whether it's, whether it's at least it's related to their sleep, uh, you know, sleep, well, if they have any sleep improvement, whether it's related to depression improvement or not. So whether there's any association between depression improvement and um, uh, uh, sleep improvement. So this is a weekly group. We obtained IRB and the, the big thing for this study is we use the real subjects. We did not change anything. So we, we just follow the uh, code policy. We have a list of medications they're not supposed to take. We have, of course, they're not supposed to use, use drugs per our policy, um, but they continue to receive real world treatment, including uh, psychotherapy and meetings, 
And if they need to be on trazodone, just continue to be on that. If they need to antidepressant, just be on, you know, uh, continue to take that. So we have three, three measurements. One is a medical outcomes um, uh, study um, sleep scale. Now we, we, sub we supplement it with another sleep scale, simple questions. Um, also, we, uh, we check the bed depression inventory, basically try to measure the, uh, the depression. So um, I'm going to quickly skip those. So this is a, this is the medical outcomes sleep um, um, medical uh, medical outcomes uh, study uh, sleep questionnaire. Uh, this questionnaire has twelve questions. Okay, it's a very it, this questionnaire is kind of a little bit complicated to use because uh, some questions like the high scores it means sleep was improved or sleep is better. Then some questions like a high score means sleep is worse. So you have to use their conversion table to, to convert all scores to, a, this is the conversion table. To finally you convert uh, the scores into, a, you know, into, a, into a, the scores we can use for measurement. So basically, uh, you know, um, subscales, we're talking about first is sleep disturbance. They look at different kinds of uh, things regarding our sleep. So sleep disturbance, snoring, uh, shortness of breath, uh, adequacy, assignments, and also sleep problem index. So, so this is uh, you know, a combination of different kind of items together to, um, to reflect your sleep problem. So now we use our own sleep uh, uh, scale, try to, uh, um, to, to, to find out whether overall the patient to report uh, sleep improvement or um, patient's you know, perception of relationship between sleep change and the their buprenorphine use. So, so then we use BDI, back inventory, to check the, um, to check the, uh, the depression. So this is the population basic characteristics. So you can see is, this, is our, this is the general description of our um, typical demographic information of our um, um, first like a 90 day program uh, patient. Except we, in, at that time, we have 75% of patients kind of employed. It's kind of unusual. Most people like a high school uh, diploma or GED, and most people between like, well, majority of people like 12 milligrams of uh, Suboxone. So this is the final result. So overall, remember, we have different kind of subscales. So sleep disturbance with time going on, and this is patient, this patients serve as their own controls. So you compare, at not time zero, 30 days, 90, 60 days, 90 days into treatment. So, so we just measure their scores. So you can see sleep disturbance, the scores kind of generally changed, right? The, the trend. Then snoring also changed, going down. Shortness of breath overall is kind of no significant, significant change. Then sleep adequacy, basically the highest score means better. So you can see adequacy is better with time going on. Then S3 and the P, uh, this is uh, um, somnus. Okay, no significant somnus is daytime sleepness basically. No significant change. Then we have sleep, overall sleep pro sleep problems index six and nine nine items items or six questions. Basically, overall the trend is kind of going down. So you can see the sleep has uh, definitely ha has improved. So you can see this scores like uh, this is over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days consistently decreased scores over time. Then we have like, uh, this is the mean score you can see for, for sleep disturbance overall and score changed dramatically actually, statistically they are significant. Of course, for this one, same thing, this is just trying to tell us whether the, your, whether the score change over time is related to the time, age, because of, because of the age difference or because of the gender difference or dose difference. Then you can see actually the correlation is only significant between time and the score change, but actually none, not a significant between age and the score change. Actually, so that means the sleep improvement is related to, is, has a high correlation um, with the time, with the, how long you have been in treatment. However, it has no correlation um, with age, gender, or dose patient use. So the back inventory, the depression inventory, you can see also the depression has changed as well. 
depression score. So overall, patients' mood improved with time going on. And 90 days, you can see the score dropped to 17%. Oh, I'm sorry, 17. So finally, so we, uh, we just uh, summarized additional substance use. This is a pretty typical for 90 day, you know, with weekly patients. So basically 55, we're talking about a 55% of patients continue to uh, use a different kind of relapsed on different kind of drugs and um, within 90 days at nine day, actually this is at, 90, at 30 day, at 30 day point. And then 47%, you know, and uh, 60, 60 day point, 8% to 90 day point. So with time going on, actually less and less people, overall less and less people uh, relapse. And this is how patients perceive the relationship between buprenorphine use and sleep change. You can see actually three is some related. Four, five, six means they are more and more related. So we're talking about about 40, 40 to 50% of patients believe their sleep change is because of buprenorphine use. So last slide, this is my conclusion. So buprenorphine naloxone ma maintained opioid use disorder patients in early recovery reported improvement. This is their self-report. Ideally, we should have done sleep study so we can have objective measurement, but we didn't do that in sleep and depression during the first 90 day treatment. This is, a, this is what I always tell patients, because when they, whenever they say, say uh, they complain about their sleep, so I usually, you know, um, I, I wait until 60 days, 90 days, because I tell them this is, a, this, is a, this is a result we got from our study. Even if it's small, of course, it's not sufficient enough to draw any conclusion, because there's so many confounding factors. However, we replicated many previous studies. And actually, we, um, um, we do believe about from, from our clinical experience and our, all our clinicians have this agreement. So the longer into recovery, the better the sleep will be. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, that thank wonderful. you. I finished in 12 minutes. That's yeah, good. that was really impressive. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Okay. All right. Um, well, so. Thanks everyone again for joining us today. I just have um, one announcement before we part ways. So our next session will be on January 27th and uh, Dr. Berry is going to be providing our didactic on waiver obtaining. Um, I know we kind of ran short on the didactic here. So if any of you have any questions or comments um, about Dr. Zhang's uh, didactic, just uh, don't hesitate to email me them and I'll have them addressed. So. Thank you all so much for joining and have a great week. Bye guys. That was good. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>